A very good evening to uh, one and all. I am Arun Kumar. I am a geneticist. I work in the capacity of therapy area expert at uh, Roche, uh, personally, uh, uh, primarily for the personalized healthcare division. So today, I would like to share some uh, thoughts on uh, comprehensive uh, genomic profiling and uh, how it can help in managing various uh, GI cancers. So uh, these are the general disclaimers, and uh, this is my agenda. I'll Start with the very basics of what cancer is, just brush up on it and uh, concentrate on what CGP is and then talk in detail about how uh, comprehensive genomic profiling can help in uh, specific GI cancers. So uh, basically, as we know, we, the human genome is organized in various levels. You have the basic double-stranded DNA helix, which is wound around uh, histone particles forming the nucleosome and which further coils into chromosome, which is uh, compacted into the nucleus. Now, genetic alterations can occur at any of these uh, uh, organizational forms of the genome, and uh, the technology used to identify such genetic alteration should, be, should have the capacity to pick up all these genetic variants at all the uh, organizational levels of the human genome. And uh, any change in the DNA is going to affect the structure of RNA, which affects the structure of protein. But what that really translates in the cell is that it's going to affect the cellular processes where uh, you have different uh, cell signaling pathways which gets tremendously altered. So uh, the point I would like to make here is that any of the malignancy is essentially a scar in the genome. It's a genomic disorder. So to understand the genetic basis of the cancer is what uh, this whole comprehensive genomic profiling is all about and that really helps us to uh, understand the tumor biology and uh, uh, designate specific clinical management strategies. So there are, uh, overall the mutations in the human genome can be categorized into four major categories. One is the point mutation which comes under the heading of base substitutions where one nucleotide becomes another classic examples include your BRAF, B600E, where, which leads to one amino acid change. Almost 98% of all human mutations in a cancer are these base substitutions, followed by small insertions, deletions, where in a sequence, one nucleotide can get inserted, one or you know up to 40, 50 nucleotides can get inserted, or few of them can get deleted. Best examples are your EGF or exon 19 deletions and so on. Then you have copy number alterations. Again, uh, the number of copies of the gene in a chromosome increases. Examples include your HER2, MYC, et cetera. And lastly, you have the gene fusions where translocation event happens, where chromosome gets cut from one, uh, gene gets cut from one chromosome and placed near a uh, gene of another chromosome, leading to a fused protein. Your ALK fusions, NTRK fusions, ROS1 fusions are all under this category of gene uh, fusions. So again, the technology to pick up such genetic aberrations should uh, efficiently pick up all the four types of genetic aberrations across the genomic organization. So to give you a uh, flavor of what CGP or comprehensive genomic profiling is, you, you have very basic techniques like immunohistochemistry, FISH and PCR. You have Sanger sequencing, NGS-based hotspot testing and comprehensive genomic profiling. So essentially, the, uh, you know, when you want to look at DNA level markers, you look at uh, FISH or PCR or genomic sequencing. RNA level markers, you look RT-PCR or RNA sequencing and at a protein level, you use a high HC. But each of these technology has its own advantages and disadvantages. Most commonly, you know, uh, category one type of tests like IHCs and PCRs and FISH are very focused to pick up only specific hotspots and it has a very good chance it misses many other markers. Hotspot NGS can pick up, say, for example, two out of four mutations in a gene, whereas Comprehensive genomic profiling is the one that can pick up all the mutations in the particular gene. So there are no sto uh, stones left unturned. So when to apply this comprehensive genomic profiling? The recent update in ASCO very categorically states that uh, any patient with metastatic or, or advanced cancer should undergo genomic sequencing. And a multi-gene panel-based assay, which, which is typically the comprehensive genomic profiling, should be used if more than one biomarker-linked therapy is approved for the particular patient's disease. So almost with the increasing number of pan-tumor markers, this income encompasses all major tumors that we come across regularly. So 
with this background of comprehensive genomic profiling, I will jump into this uh, core section of GI cancers. So uh, this uh, clearly shows some common GI cancers uh, and the genes that are very commonly mutated in these cancers. To start with, you have the esophageal cancer or the gas, uh, GEJ cancers, where you have uh, TP53, CDK2A are all the most commonly mutated genes. Apart from it, you have BRCA1, BRCA2 and the other HRR genes. Now, the ones that are marked in blue are the ones that have a targeted therapy or you have a therapeutic decision based on it. For example, ERBB2 is your HER2, you have a target for it. Now, in colorectal cancer, KRAS and NRAS really determine whether you're going to use uh, anti-EGFR uh, antibodies or not. Uh, likewise, you have in pancreatic cancers, the BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation that really determines whether the patient will benefit from uh, uh, PARP inhibitor therapy. Then you have cholangiocarcinoma where EFGFR and IDH can be targeted and hepatocellular carcinoma, you don't have a direct target, but uh, I will talk in detail about hepatocellular carcinoma in my slides. And apart from this, you have pan tumor markers like mismatch repair uh, genes. You have the microsatellite instability, which are interconnected, tumor mutation burdens, BRAF mutation, which has become pan tumor now, and you also have NTRK gene fusions. So all of which can be targeted with specific drugs. So uh, given the diversity of uh, genetic architecture in each of these tumors, uh, in this talk, I will, rest, I will highlight how comprehensive genomic profiling can help uh, understand the tumor biology and look for uh, therapeutic strategies in two specific tumors. One, a GEJ tumor. The other is a hepatocellular carcinoma, HCC. So uh, the, I will, I will show, showcase a few reports of GEJ tumors. And uh, just at the look at it, you know, there are four reports shown here. One can see how varied they are in their uh, biomarkers. No two GEJ tumor has the exact same type of genetic alteration. One has a, a SMAD4 mutation, CSF3R, another has a SDK11 loss, third has a APC mutation and FLT3 amplification, fourth has an ATM uh, mutation here. Uh, in spite of all this, uh, we will, uh, I'm sure everybody would agree that GEJ is a bit uh, difficult to treat because you have very limited targeted therapeutics uh, applied to it, unless it has, uh, uh, you know, uh, pembrolizumab or any immune checkpoint inhibitor available. Apart from that, you don't have many targeted therapy. You go for the many different types of chemotherapies. But what is in uh, interestingly found in these is almost three out of these, four, two out of these uh, four have mutations that predict response to uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor. How you again, this you can appreciate how diverse the tumors are. This patient has a STK11 loss, which is a negative prognosticator of response to immune checkpoint inhibitor. Whereas this patient has an ARIDA 1A loss, which is a positive prognostic factor for response to immune checkpoint inhibitor. Uh, it's a positive predictive value has it has. Likewise, you see almost three out of all three out of the four uh, cases have. MTAP loss, MTAP loss under CDK and 2A loss. Now let us deep dive into what this MTAP loss is. And it's a very upcoming marker in the treatment of very, uh, variety of different cancers, including urothelial carcinoma and non stone cell lung cancers. So MTAP is an enzyme. It codes for an enzyme, which uh, actually activates the salvage pathway of adenine synthesis. So uh, you have the methyl adenosine, which gets converted to adenine and MTR1P using this enzyme MTAP. Now, this is the salvage pathway. And you, in, as you know, we also have a de novo pathway of purine synthesis, which produces AMP and later produces ATP. Now, there are studies which have targeted this particular concept of MTAP, where you know, you have the classical uh, you know, uh, antifolate agents like uh, pemetrexid, which blocks the de novo pathway. Now, the patient is having normal de novo or the uh, tumor cell has a normal de novo pathway, but a uh, MTAP loss. So when you block the de novo pathway, uh, theoretically, the patient, uh, the cell will not be able to synthesize nucleotides, uh, nucleotides adequately, and that leads to tumor cell death and apoptosis. This has been leveraged in certain studies to show that 
Pemetrexid is a good uh, uh, agent to be treated on uh, cells that lack MTAP. So here you can see the cell viability on the y-axis and the concentration of uh, pemetrexid on the x-axis. And the ones in the, uh, the, the uh, red are all cells that lack MTAP and these are the cells that lack, uh, that are proficient with MTAP and the cell viability uh, is very varied. Uh, so basically those which lack MTAP are able to kind of respond. Now, the uh, cellular studies, apart from that, clinical studies have also been done and a retrospective analysis of uh, uh, urothelial carcinoma cases have shown that uh, uh, in a very small subject of four out of four urothelial carcinoma cases, which had MTAP deficiency, had a good objective response rate to pemetrexin. And uh, notably, eight out of 10 patients with the MTAP proficiency urothelial carcinoma had an increase in the tumor volume from the baseline. And a prospective study was also performed and the objective response rate was reached in 42% of the cases, although the study was on very limited, it's the, I'm quoting all anecdotal studies here, and very limited grade uh, uh, you know, treatment related ad uh, adverse events. And uh, the second point is the CDK and 2A gene and the MTAP gene are in the same chromosome very next to each other. So when you find MTAP amplification, you eventually find CDK and 2A amplification also, which means there is an amplification of the chromosome 9P and a retrospective analysis of the battle trial of uh, non-small cell lung cancer patients who were treated with pemetrexid again showed that uh, those with MTAP loss had a better objective response rate, which was almost 54% compared to those, uh, compared to only 24% in the other cases. So the bottom line is MTAP, targeting MTAP in the GEJ cancer could be one possible strategic approach in uh, when you have exhausted all standard lines of therapy. Now, this is where, you know, uh, when you see the tumor through the lens of uh, comprehensive genomic profiling and molecular analysis of the CGP report really helps you strategize such advanced cases of cancer. Uh, in the next, I will talk about certain uh, uh, examples of how CGP can help in refractory HCC uh, uh, cases. Now, here I'm just showcasing six cases, and you can see all of them were done by liquid biopsy, and you can see a uh, very marked similarity in the type of mutation. So this is one, two, three case, and these are the four, five, and six case. Now, what do we see? Two of them, uh, of the first three, you have two of them have an elevated tumor fraction. The second also you had, so four out of six cases had an elevated tumor fraction. What does that mean? The tumor burden that is there in the circulatory system is very high which is a very poor prognosticator of response to therapy as well as a very poor prognosticator of for the patient. The patient is going to succumb or patient is going to progress extremely early. Apart from this, we obviously see that the amplification of FGF3, 4, 19 and CCND1 is characteristically present in all the cases. And also third promoter mutation and a TP53 mutation, particularly in the 249th position of TP53. I'll just visit that particular position of 249, why it is so important. So let us deep dive into these molecular aspects. What does this mean? Of course, it shows that it is not directly targetable, but are there targets available? So coming to the FGF3, 4, and the 9, they all fall under the same chromosome 11. Again, it's a chromosome level amplification, and FGF is involved in a lot of uh, uh, biochemical pathways in the uh, liver. And uh, studies have shown that FGF amplified tumors uh, show excellent response to TKI, uh, particularly the sorafenib. And uh, so hence this patient might be a better candidate for a TKI treatment than a uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor based therapy. Likewise, the TP53 mutation that was identified of all the different types of TP53 mutations, this particular R249S is a uh, very aggressive type of a mutation where you can see that the cellular migration studies show limited margin here, meaning that this makes the cell migrate very easily, which means that the metastasis and the aggressiveness of the tumor is very high, which harbor this particular mutation. So irrespective of the tumor treatment given, the TP53, this particular mutation is going to make the patient progress very easily. 
TERT, I'm sure we all know it's a very important gene uh, which uh, uh, maintains the telomeric length. And uh, in all progression of liver from a healthy liver to a chronic disease to a malignant formation, uh, TERT plays a very crucial role in uh, because that is mostly the second hit that you uh, get to uh, just before malignancy. And it's one of the most common mutations that's seen in hepatocellular carcinomas. And, uh, well, you know, studies have shown that the percentage of survival of patients with TERT mutation is much lower compared to those uh, who are in the wild type category. Likewise, uh, you know, overall survival for those who are mutation positive is statistically less compared to those who are mutation negative. And recurrence after uh, hepatectomy is again much uh, higher in those who are mutation positive compared to those who are in mutation negative category. Uh, lastly, you saw that the patient also, the, all the patients who were refractory also had a CCND1 amplification, which is a very poor prognosticator to immunotherapy response. So again, if you're going to give uh, frontline ICIs, you're going to see that in pan cancer, data clearly suggests those who are, uh, uh, you know, CCND amplification positive, this, this uh, orange one, have a much poorer overall survival than those who are negative. And a subset analysis, again, even if they have a high tumor mutation burden, it is still irrespective that the patient is going to survive, have a poor response to immune checkpoint inhibitor because of this particular gene's amplification. So uh, the point I, I wanted to make here, or I would like you to appreciate is that once we understand the genetic architecture of the tumor, we would be able to predict the response to therapies. We'd be able to identify novel therapies and we would also be able to prognosticate the patient in a much better fashion. So I uh, close the talk with this uh, words from the Art of War book, victorious warriors first win and then go to the war while the defeated warriors go to the war first and then seek to win. So here the war is against the cancer or the tumor for the particular patient. And to understand the war field, uh, the very crucial point, apart from, uh, of course, the most important ones, you have the clinical profile. Genomics also plays a very crucial one in understanding the war field so that you can target and uh, target your clinical management accordingly. With this, I thank you all for your uh, patience and I'll be very happy to answer any questions if there are. Thank you, uh, Dr. G. Arun Kumar. Uh, your uh, lecture was very interesting. So.